Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Walker, and I'm the assistant curator of the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming and welcome you to our virtual event tonight, uh, book reading and conversation with Reva Lair. Um, please feel free to let us know at any point um, in the chat if a uh, description, a verbal description of the upcoming slides would be helpful for you. We are more than happy to provide that accommodation. Um, in a few moments, Reva Lair is going to read from her book, um, after which we'll spend some time discussing her work. Following that conversation, I will moderate a Q&A session um, in which you are all invited to ask or submit questions in the chat window. Um, please feel free to submit these questions at any point during the reading or the talk, whenever a question strikes you, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so I'd like to introduce Reva. Reva Lair is a Chicago-based author, artist, and curator whose work is um, whose work examines the socially challenged body. In her decades of work, Reva has focused primarily on portraiture. Um, and self-portraiture, representation, desire, vulnerability, risk, and power dynamics, all playing a role in that work. Her portrait subjects are friends, colleagues, lovers, peers, people whose works, attitudes, and thought processes she admires. She portrays members of her queer and disabled communities with nuance, reverence, and love as she explores these subjects um, the subjects of stigma, power, and beauty. Reva's work, um, Risk Pictures, Portrait of David Mitchell, was recently displayed in the Cleve Carney Museum of Art summer exhibition, Hooking Up, Meet the Collection. And her work has also been exhibited at the Chicago Cultural Center, the Smithsonian, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and many others. In 2020, uh, Reva published her first book, Golem Girl, a memoir, we have included a couple of links in the chat to some independent bookstores that carry her work or her book, um, including Women and Children First in Chicago and the bookstore of Glen Ellen. I'm so excited to have Reva here to read from Golem Girl and discuss her artistic process. So without further ado, I'm going to give her the floor and share my screen with some slides. Evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming tonight. Um, do turn on your cameras if you are so inclined. It's uh, nice to see the audience since we're doing it that way. Um, what are we doing here, Julia? Um, I am opening up my slides so you can go ahead and start reading from or introduce your book or start reading from it whenever you're ready. Uh, okay, I thought we were doing slides after the reading. But... Oh, I just wanted to pull up the book cover for you. It's so beautiful. Okay, it's, yes, the, <clears throat> um, the book is, is right here. So this is, it's out in paper. Uh, there's a beautiful hardcover edition that has a secret cover on it. And um, uh, okay. Um, uh, Julia, I, if, um, if we can wait for the slides sure. so that people can see me while I'm reading. Um, otherwise, I'm kind of a postage stamp. Great, thanks. Um, let me find the document, which has decided to disappear. As they right. do. Um, as they do, believe me. So uh, I'm going to be reading off the screen. So for the moment, I can't see you guys. I assume you can still see me. Yes. Yep. Um, so a little bit about the book before I read this section. Um, Golem Girl is about a number of things, but uh, it's rooted in what it meant to grow up at a time before there was the ADA or IDEA or any legal rights for people with disabilities pretty much at all. Certainly no cultural programming, no, really no understanding of disability as an identity or as a political uh, force. And so uh, most people my age um, were institutionalized if they were born with my impairment. 
um, for reasons that you'll read if, if you do read the book. Uh, I had an amazing stroke of very strange luck um, that kept me out of an institution, really down to my mother. And, um, but one of the things that happened to me, uh, so the first part of the book is called Golem, and the second part is called Girl. And Golem is about being constructed as a monster um, from my earliest days, uh, literally in terms of many, 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 many surgeries, sort of inventing the body that I have, um, but also being constructed as a monster because society kept telling me basically that I was a monster. And um, one of the things that happened to me is that I went to a so-called special school. Uh, it was called Condon School. It was in Cincinnati. I'm from Cincinnati. It was originally opened, I believe, in 1921. And at the time, it was um, considered to be uh, amazingly progressive. And the really progressive thing about it was that it wasn't an institution that um, we were given pretty close to a standard academic education for elementary school kids. So kindergarten to ninth grade. And this is at a time that most kids, like I said, um, with impairments were sent to institutions where they were given minimal, if any education, it pretty much geared towards doing things like uh, working in a warehouse at best, um, sheltered workshops, sweatshops, um, warehouse. I mean, most people my age, um, I don't see them because they never left the institution. So Condon was this breakthrough, um, again, for really interesting, complicated reasons that decided that disabled kids were worth educating. And so in 1963, I entered in kindergarten and I graduated in 1972. And the piece I'm gonna read um, is, uh, true it's about the fact that the school was haunted and what that meant so each chapter in um golem girl is named after a different horror movie or novel or um uh painting sometime um and the title of this chapter let me remember is called the changeling and um, it's edited from the original. <clears throat> so it's, uh, what year is it there? Um, I think I was in seventh grade, something like that, sixth grade. Um, so 1970-ish, I think. All right. Um, Oh, uh, one other thing you should know is that Condon was originally built for kids with mobility impairments, but it ended up um, uh, being opened to kids with a wide variety of impairments. Um, again, the book kind of goes into the, not just the history, but in, in Golem Girl, what I tried to do um, was talk about my life in a way that opened up aspects of American history, disability history, um, socio-political meaning, but from a very intimate viewpoint. So I would write about something that happened and then sort of back up a little bit and talk about um, the context and things that might not be readily apparent. So the changeling. At Condon, students who could walk often used it as a way to flout the rules. Julie, oh, um, hang on a second. I'm not at my absolutely most organized. I know that you are sitting there in shock going, what? An artist who is not amazingly organized? How can this be? All right, let me back up. Julie was my best friend. Um, we met in kindergarten and she remained my best friend all the way through Condon. The changeling. 
At Condon, students who could walk often used it as a way to flout the rules. Julie and I were admittedly epic flouters. We liked to sneak into such forbidden zones as the boiler room and backstage at the auditorium. Taboo gilded them with far more fascination than they merited. When everyone else took elevators to lunch, Julie and I opted for the marble stairs. By sixth grade, we were seasoned outlaws. One winter afternoon that year, we'd been heading down the steps when Julie abruptly stopped and seized my arm. Wait, she breathed, stay right there. There's something I've been meaning to show you. I frowned. There was nothing in that stairwell I hadn't seen a hundred times before. Walls painted in two sickly shades of green, hung with thick hand rolls like warped and lacquered Tootsie Rolls. I don't see anything unusual. Is there something I'm missing? Yeah, just walk down one more step. One more and, okay, stop. You feel anything weird? Uh, yeah, well, it's freaky cold. Is that what you mean? She jerked her chin. Let's go back up the landing. Julie demonstrated the cold was confined to a three-step section. Top of the landing, warm. Two steps down, meat locker. I shrugged. So what? I don't know. Maybe the radiators are broke. No, she flailed her arms in exasperated semaphore. Don't you get it? This is a cold spot. A cold spot is what happens when someone dies. We just walk straight through a ghost. Ah, Julie caught me in mid-flight. She insisted that we sit in the middle of the spot while she recited every story she'd ever heard about kids who died at Condon. And it turned out there was quite a list. So um, Linda says that a long time ago, this kid lost control of his wheelchair and it rolled down the stairs and Amy heard about this other girl. She had a seizure and she fell off the third floor balcony. You know, those porches at the back of the school. And uh, Todd, he says, this first grader drowned in the swimming pool. When? When what? Did they, uh, I don't know, like a hundred years ago? What Julie didn't say was that we all knew kids who had died. Our first friend to go was Janie, thin and agile and lemur-eyed. Second grade, heart disease. There were kids we knew and others we'd just seen around, kids like Jimmy and Don and Diana, who'd gone into the hospital on a one-way ticket. Neither Julie nor I said their names as we paced the cold spot. It was easier to imagine an icy child from a distant long ago. None of the adults ever talked to us about our disappeared friends. No grief counselors reassured us that we were not next. Death was our shared but private child's knowledge. And so we began holding lunchtime seances in seventh and eighth grade. We met in homeroom, pulled down the shades, turned the lock on the classroom door, and the Ouija board was unearthed from its hiding place in the coat room closet. It wasn't easy to overcome our nerves and giggles and to hold hands in the dark without feeling like a dork. We asked no serious questions. No one brought up anything medical or mortal whatsoever. Instead, we pestered the Ouija board about crushes and secrets as if the great beyond was one big pajama party. We denied that the planchette was ever pushed by our living fingers. And when the board spoke, we never asked to speak to any of our lost friends. But maybe they hung around the room anyway. We always began a seance by chanting, oh, spirits, show us a sign. And more than once, they seemed to oblige such as the time that a mason jar containing a pickled frog shot off the science table, flew all the way across the room, and smashed itself against the wooden lockers. And then there was the giant ball of colored light that appeared over our table, hovering and pulsing like a lava lamp before slowly fading away. Someone hissed, do you see that? From the dark came a whispered, yes. 
we returned to eating in the cafeteria with all the officially alive people. Thanks. There's, there's actually a second part to that ghost story, um, which is in some ways even stranger. Great. Thank you so much, Mariva. Um, okay. That actually is one of my favorite passages from the book. I'm so glad you picked it. I live to please. <laughs> Even when you don't know. Um, yeah. One thing that um, really strikes me in particular about that section and kind of I think is applicable to the entire book is how trustworthy as a voice the book has like it feels like I can believe what you're saying it feels like such an honest depiction of what happened and especially given like some of these memories are from your earliest childhood um so that was just something that like when I'm reading these ghost stories I'm like oh I, I completely believe it and I don't know that every author could pull that off um and I think a lot of it has to do with your very impressive concrete detail um, and particularly the way you describe the scene in a way that makes it very easy to visualize. Um, so I wondered if like those intensely intensely accurate descriptions was kind of a purposeful style choice or did that just happen as you were writing? Um, it took me a long time to learn how to write insofar as I know how to write, which is, you know, um very much learning on the job uh i think that um i mean i'm visual so it helps with thinking moving your head around in the space inside your head and like what does it look like what's going on what are people doing um so that helped um i had actually had mixed feelings about putting that in because i worried that it would lose credibility if i did but the ghost story not only has another section, uh, which was witnessed by an entire auditorium full of people, uh, it, there's a chapter that was taken out of the book in which I um, interviewed, uh, so Condon was knocked down and the faculty moved to another school, a very a modern 70s brick stupid box. And um, I mean, Condon had been gorgeous. It was built by um, the same people that did Cincinnati Music Hall, um, City Hall. Uh, I mean, our, our major buildings also were done by the same firm. So it was quite beautiful. If you know what Rookwood pottery is, it was full of Rookwood tiles and, and um, ceramics. And later on uh, in 2004, I think, I got to interview these faculty members and, and employees, staff who had moved over. And I just asked them, the only thing I asked them was, did anything weird ever happen at Condon? And I got such an earful of ghost stories, things that I hadn't known anything about. The elevators, there were like adult ghosts in the elevators. And so I felt better about, <laughs> like, oh, I really didn't make this up. Um, but so as I was saying, uh, the book, um, like I said, is in two parts. And the first part is uh, up until I go to college. And in college, um, I'm trying to figure out how to be an adult in the face of, uh, again, growing up at a time that there were no adult um, role models at all that I knew of. I mean, they existed a little bit, but nobody told me about them. Um, so how, how was someone supposed to be an adult? And then eventually um, moving into, you know, going to art school, figuring out why I wanted to be an artist in the first place, and then becoming um, involved with the really foundational members of disability culture in America. And that's what really transformed my life. Um, so the whole thing is kind of this arc of becoming. And I feel, felt and feel still that it's not that important that it was my life. Um, what felt important to me is that I'd had experiences that could um, open up things to, for people who 
um, for whom this was a new world. But, you know, in terms of my work and portraiture, my portrait work is entirely based on story. And so I've been working with other people's stories for decades now, first off, how to, how to get them from someone, how to think about taking a story and making it into a portrait. Um, but also something that hit me after the book came out is that I don't know if there's anybody out there that teaches art, um, but the interesting thing about teaching art, or I think also being a curator at times, is that most, at least let's say painting and drawing, um, sculpture, they're not verbal media. And when you're teaching it or having to explain it, you have to take something that's essentially not verbal at all and bring it to words. So that if you're teaching your student, you know, why this line isn't working or why they should use a different ochre or something, you have to like yank that, that mute, um, entirely visual experience, you know, into the mouth. And I think that that's really good training for a writer as well. Yeah, definitely something I've helped my own students with. And I think that that was very um, aptly put as a transition to writing about your own life. Um, did you want to dive into those slides now? Sure. All right. Do you, do you have the slide of David to start with? Sure. I can't remember all of a sudden. Did I send it to you? Um, you didn't, but I do have it. Um, let's see, can you see the screen? Yeah, if you need me to get a better one. Um, sure, if you have find, a... Let me, uh, the magic that is Finder, <laughs> hang on a second. Because um, I think it would be helpful to be able to see it clearly. Where are you, dear? Kind. Give me, oh my goodness, there's a lot of, okay. Um, here we are. Is this a good one? Okay, uh, shall I do screen share for a second? Sounds great. And then, or I can email it to you really quickly. Um, why don't you, we'll see if Zoom cooperates and lets us. Okay, <laughs> um, yes, it's, uh, technical hour with um, Julia and Reva. Yes, okay. welcome to your IT lesson of the day. Yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll come back to this, but this is what was in the show. And when we go and look at the slide that Julia has of its context, um, but just to kind of launch us specifically um, to the museum. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the author, David Mitchell, um, Irish author. He wrote, uh, I guess his best known work is Cloud Atlas because it became a movie, but he also, I mean, he's written at least 10 novels. Um, they're utterly brilliant. Um, he's one of my three favorite contemporary authors for sure. And he also wrote Sensate, um, part of Sense8, if people saw that on, on Netflix, which is, has the best sex scenes I've ever seen on television. So <laughs> if you're, if you're at a loss for anything to do tonight, <laughs> go find Sense8 on, on Netflix. Um, but I met David because he was in town from Ireland, working with the author uh, uh, Alexander Heyman and with the Wachowski um, formerly brothers, now sisters, Lily and Lana Wachowski on writing the finale for Sense8. And um, I was in the park doing my, my daily walk by the lake. And here comes, uh, Alexander goes by Sasha. Here comes Sasha with his helmet on and he's got another guy there. And 
I would see Sasha in the park fairly regularly. And he, he rides up to me and he goes, oh, Riva, I'm so glad to see you. I want you to meet my friend. And so his friend pulls off his um, helmet and I literally fell over. <laughs> like, oh my God, it's David Mitchell. I didn't know he was in town at all. But we became friends and uh, his son is disabled. So we talked a lot about um, contemporary experience of disability. And uh, he is such a kind man with, with being brilliant as well. This is not the most accurate drawing I've ever done, but he only had an hour and a half. So he came over and he sat on my couch. And what this series is, uh, the risk pictures I'm not sure I want to back up. We'll get into this in a second. But um, my practice is based on uh, addressing the power dynamics between artist and subject, um, trying to refute the traditional dynamics where either the artist is in control or the subject's in control because they're commissioning the work. And so I come up with a lot of projects to try and look for mutual vulnerability. So this drawing is from a recent series called The Risk Pictures. And in Risk, what I've been doing is normally someone would commit to five live sittings. And with David, like I said, all I got was an hour and a half. But um, normally it would be five live sittings minimum. Um, each one would be three hours, but at the two hour mark, I would pick, put on my coat and put on my purse and leave my apartment. And what my collaborator would get in as I left were two things, complete control of my home. I mean, complete, they could do anything they wanted. And the deal was I would never ask, you know, like they could everything from eating my food, sleeping in my bed to walking off with stuff, breaking stuff. I, there were no rules, um, but in exchange, they had to alter their portrait while I was gone. So the plan was because there would be five sittings that they would start in a place, I would respond to it. Then the next time they came, they would do another alteration. I'd respond to that. And in the same way that I would never ask what they had done while I was gone. And sometimes people told me, and sometimes it was kind of obvious what they'd done. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I was not allowed to um, erase or, or obliterate what they had done. I could respond to it. I could elaborate it um, any way I wanted, but there would be no covering it over. And so the risk was, first off, it's risky for someone to sit for a portrait, it's a scary thing. And David's better looking than I managed to make him there and he knows it. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I only had an hour and a half and you were David Mitchell and I was scared. <laughs> uh, but um, so just sitting for me is daunting. So in me giving them my home and their portrait, it puts me in a real place of vulnerability because it's very possible that they would wreck it, that they would do something that would be catastrophic. Um, I was less concerned about my house actually than I was about what they do to the drawing. So what happened here was because David only had an hour and a half. He sat for me, he was reading a book by a mutual friend of ours and he couldn't stay to work on it. So I packed it up and I gave it to him and I said, just get it back to me before you go back to Ireland. So I didn't get it back until after he'd left because they were writing into the very last second. But when I got it back, what he had done was use it as a diary of his last six days in Chicago. So each of these colors is a different day. It's not only a meditation on what that day had been about and what it was like to be here, it was also an exploration of the meaning of that color insofar as he knew it to be something that would culturally shift. So like he was talking about what red means in Korea. Um, each one of these tries to touch on something 
unexpected and it's the most wonderful gift. I mean, it's one of the only two pieces I've ever made that will never be sold what, you know, while I'm around. So I was really happy that Julia chose it because it doesn't get, it doesn't get shown. It kind of hangs out in my bedroom and, you know, if you, if you, if you ever want to actually deal with seeing another thing of me babbling on Zoom and God knows why, but David did my book launch and for the Chicago Humanities Festival. So we had over an hour of talking together on Zoom. This is right after COVID hit. And you can see just what a remarkable human he is. So I'm gonna stop share here and I'm back and go for what you want, Julia. Um, all right. And yeah, it was just like such a moment of, um, I don't know, call it fate, call it serendipity of you saying, oh yes, this work is not only available, I have it. And like, it was just such an amazing moment. It felt like it was just meant to be. Um, so here is um, the David Mitchell portrait in the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. It was hung alongside Mel Bachner's Useless. And um, just for those of you who didn't get a chance to come see the summer exhibition, um, we took works from our permanent collection and paired them up with works by um, contemporary Chicago area artists. So we have this amazing text-based work by Mel Bachner, and it's one of his thesaurus paintings where he strings together the synonyms for whatever words he starts with. So here it's useless. And if you read through it, it just creates this feeling of melancholia, which is really um, kind of driven home by the medium. In person, you can see it's on this heavy black velvet with this thick acrylic paint. And it's really kind of a kind of a downer of a painting. <laughs> but then you turn your attention to Riva's work. And it's this intimate portrait of a pensive looking man as he and you read through this letter and it's just it feels like he's writing to you even though he you never met him um and so I just I was so incredibly moved by this when I saw it on your website Riva and I really encourage everyone go on her website find this image under the risk pictures collection and you can like zoom in and actually read it it's just it's beautiful um and so this kind of inspired a activity in the museum because uh, David Mitchell's last line in this letter is people should write more letters. They're good for us. And so we had this activity in the museum. This is right next to her work where you can sit down and we had stationery for you to actually write a letter to one of the, or as many of the artists as you wanted and then we had this little mailbox for you to slip it in there. And Reva, I have a few letters for you. I'll get them to you. Um, and it was just this incredible moment of people coming together and I think viewing the artist as more of a person rather than just like this artwork magically manifested here. Um, and I think we can kind of draw that back to Reva, your um, ideas on the power dynamic and how that kind of expands into the art world, like beyond just the making of the piece. Oh, I. Sorry. That's a question. Sort of. Um, <laughs> just your, <laughs> your thoughts? Question mark. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, power dynamics in the art world. I mean, yeah, like you yourself feel depressed. <laughs> Just think about that for a while. Um, you know, one of the uh, things that's always dismayed me um, about museums and galleries in terms of portraiture is that um, uh, you go into, you know, the Art Institute here and there are all these incredible portraits and it'll say something like, you know, Painting of Philip II by Anthony Van Dyke, you know, date, donor, year, something like that. And you have no idea whether Philip and, and you know, whether the king and Van Dyke liked each other, um, whether 
uh, Van Dyck had, you know, um, campaigned to do the portrait, if he was already the court painter, um, if Van Dyck was being painted by a lot of different painters, what the painting was used for. A lot of times, uh, for instance, I don't know if people know that like a favored nobleman might pay a painter to do a portrait of the king as um, uh, a gift, you know, uh, a gift for the king so that the king would look on the noble person favorably. Um, you know, uh, what do they call it in Chicago? Bribes. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then there were portraits. So like, what was that like? And sometimes in, um, uh, particularly in portraits of royals, um, I mean, I'm talking about sort of, you know, early Renaissance to um, uh, mid 19th century, say, um, that sometimes when you're painting a royal, what would happen is that the royal person would come and sit down for a little while and you would work on their head and their hands. And then they would send in a um, servant to put on the costume and sit there while the painter, you know, did the Queen Elizabeth's insane beaded, pearled, laced, gilded dresses. I mean, the queen was not sitting there for, you know, six months in her dress. Um, so there can be these odd dislocations, but like, again, the public doesn't know this. Um, and the big question though, is were either of them changed by working together? Did, did the artist find things in themselves that were pulled forward by working with that person? Did the subject, um, see themselves differently. Um, there's a, so much to say about the history of portraiture, but you walk into a museum and you would, it just looks transactional. And that is not the truth. Anyone who works in portraiture knows that if you're good at what you do, and I mean, I don't These are very emotional, fraught, scary, demanding experiences. Um, and you would never know that. And so I really wanted to bring out, um, there are various other ways that I've tried to bring the intimacy of the portrait relationship into the gallery. Um, but that's, you know, so the power dynamic is one thing, but then also having the viewer think about what was going on? Can, can, did they get any feeling about whether these two people liked each other, couldn't stand each other, what? Um, I mean, you look at a Goya and you can tell which, which members of the royal family Goya was, was uh, fond of and which ones not so much. Um, it's amazing that he was never beheaded. So I don't see the point of doing a portrait unless it's a real experience between two human beings. I think that's so beautiful. And I think that's really evident in your work. Um, I'll just, is there one that you'd like to start with in particular to talk about uh, or focus uh, in on? Um, I'm sorry, these are scrambled. Um, hmm. uh, let me just- Can you go to a slide? Oof. Sorry, just trying to get to the beginning for you. There you go. All right. Um, we can just go in order. Okay. I think it might be easiest. Sorry, one second. There you go. Technology makes our lives better. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so again, that's a co the cover, but that's also a detail of a self-portrait. Um, and you get the, we have this. <laughs> It's the front piece. See it, but it's a large, very large painting. Um, for me, large. And so that's a detail of the piece called Blue Veronica. 
So um, now the thing is, we don't have that much time and there are immense stories to tell about each one of these. So I'm just going to try my best to touch lightly. And please ask me questions, Julia. Um, actually, why don't you ask me for each one of these, ask me what you'd like to know about it. Right, sure. Um, so with this one, um, I'm sorry, my cat is scratching things up back there. Um, so this one I was really excited to come upon in your book because I so uh, admire Alison Bechtel and her work that she does in the feminist community and like the Bechtel test for those who don't know is something she kind of created um, where it's the judge of not necessarily a feminist movie, but just a good judge of representation in a movie where are there two named female characters who talk to each other about something other than a man? Um, and it's hard to find movies that actually fit that. Um, so that's kind of some of the focus of her work. And I wondered if when you're doing a portrait of an artist, which is a lot of your portraiture, does their work besides like what they're adding to it ha come into it like the subject of their work or is it more about your experience with them um how do those two things kind of reconcile um I would say that less than a third of the people that I work with well if you mean by artists people in the arts yeah. in general yeah most most people I'd say two-thirds at least are people in the arts one way or another. Actual visual artists, not that many. Um, Allison is an exception. And this piece uh, was done, so Allison wrote Fun Home, which became that huge Broadway hit musical um, maybe four years ago. And she was, though back in uh, 2011, she was working on her second memoir. Um, the first one, Fun Home, is about her father and sort of tragic circumstances of his life um, and how they affect, affected Allison and her coming out. Um, but at the time that we were working together, she was uh, deep into her second memoir called Are You My Mother? And so for the piece, what I did was Allison lives in Vermont um, and she would come in sporadically to Chicago for book events. And so whenever she'd come in town, I would grab her for, you know, one day, two days, something like that to sit for me. And we were talking a lot about looking back. Um, I hadn't, I was working on the memoir, but I wasn't thinking of it as a memoir. It was sort of writing some personal stuff that would go on to become the book, but um, it wasn't coherent at the time. I was more thinking about directions I wanted to take in my studio practice, because for the most part, I was known, am known as someone who does portraits of people with disabilities. And the thing is that really what I do is I work with people who undergo stigma. So a lot of that is disability, but I also work with people in the queer community, a lot of trans folk, um, people who've experienced stigma because of race, um, whole range of things, gender uh, performance. Um, if something gets you targeted, I want to know how it affects you, the work that you do. So for this, um, Allison sat for me and I had her trying, <laughs> I gave her a big sheet of um, foam core and a dowel with a dip pen on it and a mirror. And I said, try to draw yourself backwards over your shoulder. <laughs> and so I still have the piece of foam core with Allison scribbles all over it. Um, but once I got this, the basic drawing down, I traced it on a big piece of, um, of uh, heavy duty tracing paper, rolled it up and sent it to her in Vermont. And it was just a tracing of her and of the room. And that was it. And said, um, put your mother in here somewhere. Don't tell, I'm not, I don't care where, I don't know how it works, you know, but because uh, if you look, you see her, Allison's shadow, her shadow is actually not her. It's Mo, her avatar character from her longtime uh, 
a comic strip called Dykes to Watch Out For. So I was actually, she had gotten a lot of shit from stopping that series because it had been really important to the lesbian community. And so she got a lot of blowback when she ended that series. So I drew her as Mo in the shadow. So I wasn't sure if we were just gonna stop there, but she sent me back this drawing, you know, exactly fitting in. And so I had to hand transfer it inch by inch just folding back each little piece of the um, tracing paper and trying to replicate Allison's line. And that really launched uh, my pursuit of having people work on their own portraits. I hadn't oh. done it up till then. So this was really the pivotal piece. Awesome. And it's 3D, by the way. You can't tell, but Allison is a cutout. Um, Every Allison and the dowel rod are cutouts. The wallpaper is actually peeling off the wall, and the wallpaper is an exact um, replica of the William Morris Cabbages and Roses wallpaper that she had had in her family home, which had been a funeral home. So all these interlocking things, but it, it's dimensional. Amazing. It's Thank you. NPG now. Um, I do want to let everyone know, like, feel free to type into the chat any questions you have, and we'll try to address them as we go. Oh, um, I figured we'd do them after. Sure. It's, Let me it's gather. Just, Here, let's go fast. And, okay. Uh, yes, please put your questions in, and we'll get to them at the very end. Sure. Um, what would you like to know about this one? Um, so this one, I was incredibly moved by your discussion of how agency plays a role in this piece. So I wondered if you could discuss that for our viewers. Um, this is even more dimensional. The owl is fully a construction and the wings come off the, the drawing by about four inches. It's wings made out of uh, organ, organza and Bible pages. And the owl is made out of um, Japanese rice papers, uh, wood, clay, glass. Um, this is a portrait of my dear friend, Tim Lowley, um, whose daughter is profoundly disabled. Her name is Tema. Um, there's a lot to say about their relationship. Definitely look up Tim's work because most of his work are, is, are portraits of Tema, thinking about um, what love is, what, uh, religious belief. Um, well, anyway, again, it's hard to talk about these because the stories are so deep. But the point is that because Tema is profoundly disabled and is not verbal at all, um, Tim had asked me to do a portrait of the two of them together. I feel that he has the right to do her portrait because not only is he her parent, he and his wife, Sherry, keep Tema literally alive day by day. Um, but all of my practice is based on informed consent. So Tema couldn't consent uh, to being depicted. And so instead I did a, a portrait of their relationship. And again, talking about power dynamics and the ethics of the studio. Um, at first he was really dismayed that I would not draw Tema directly, but I think once this happened that he was, he was pretty, he got it and, you know, it's meant a lot to him. So, um, and I was glad to come up with a way of working with my, one of my very dearest friends in a way that felt ethically responsible. Great, thank you. Um, keep moving along. So the next one uh, you sent was Alice Shepard. Um, and this one, I'm really interested in hearing more about the process of creating this work, because I know there was a little more trepidation maybe than with some of your other works. Um, Alice uh, is another very close friend. Um, she's a dancer, choreographer, so brilliant, I can't even tell you. Um, if you have time, look her, look her up and look up uh, Wired. Um, just to let you know, she's, she's doing 
choreography, aerial choreography with wheelchairs. So they're dancing up in the air um, in wheelchairs. Let your mind go there. It's amazing. Um, but so Allison had been part of Risk Pictures and uh, she had been in town for about two weeks uh, to collaborate with another dancer. So she was coming over a lot. She was actually really sitting for me, which was great. Um, but the first day that I put on my coat and went to leave, um, she was supposed to call me in an hour and let me know that, uh, that it was okay to come back. And she didn't call me and she didn't call me and she didn't call me. And it was like an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes. And I'm like, oh my God. And finally she calls me and she says, excuse my language, but she says, Reaver, uh, and she's British. Uh, Reaver, I think I might've fucked up. Like, and I'm imagining, oh God, what does that mean? And so I had gotten pretty far from my apartment and just going around nervously waiting for her to call. So I just ran back to my place and I'm imagining, you know, ketchup or something all over the drawing. And so she had, um, we had sort of had a plan. I generally don't plan at all with my collaborators, but she had wanted to talk through her idea. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And here's the materials you'll need to do that. And so I walked in and she said, yeah, I didn't do what we talked about. And indeed she had not. And um, at the first thing I saw was that she had drawn these little rude characters looking up her private parts and little hands grabbing her breasts. And this was not at all had <laughs> my con conception of Alice. And she had sort of drawn these, these feet and hands, but they were sort of floating in midair. And so I was pretty upset at first because it really changed the feeling that it had been in my mind about where we were going. Um, but I ended up drawing into it and then doing a background in response to what we were doing that was different than what I had had in mind as well. It's a very large drawing, um, it's 40 by 50 inches. I generally work really small, um, not so much lately. Work is getting bigger and bigger, but it's three layers of mylar acetate, frosted mylar. So Alice is drawn with pastel and uh, colored pencil on the front. If you turn over the first layer, she's painted from the back with really hot colors that sort of glow through the mylar. And then the next layer has um, the, uh, the figure, which I don't have time to talk about, and part of the wheelchair drawing. And then the final layer has the, the curtains. Um, with the ropes and there's a lot of narrative tying this together but what I loved and what I love about doing these is that the drawings always become more interesting always become more interesting I I would do this every time if I could just give up control and let my collaborator do the driving and we'll end up somewhere that I could not have gotten by myself Amazing. Um, okay, keeping us moving. So the next one we have here is Carrie Sandal. Um, and I wondered if you just kind of wanted to address this and the kind of ephemera that went along with it. Um, oh, um, yes. Well, um, as I said, uh, I've been trying to bring the intimacy of the portrait relationship into the gallery. So this was shown in a local museum here. And what I, what Carrie and I did while we were working on this, this took an entire summer and it's about two thirds life size. And Carrie is wearing BDSM gear because we were talking about the eroticizing of pain. We have some similar disability issues. And so we spent a lot of that summer talking about pain um, and at the same time, we were doing two things. Uh, I gave Carrie a stack of handmade paper, and we were separately writing what it was like to work together over that summer. And then her partner was setting up uh, tape or digital recorders, tape recorders, God, I'm old, 
um, and documenting all of our conversations. So when the show was originally put together, the, this was on one wall with two speakers on either side that were playing our conversation. On the wall across from it was all of the handmade paper with our conversation going on separately. But then in the corner was the setup I had used with Carrie to keep her comfortable in between sessions. So there was her chair with her heating pad and pillows with her footstool with a little table that had cookies and tea on it. And I brought the entire thing into the gallery because I really wanted people to understand how physical it is for both of us to do this. And um, the funny story is that this, when the museum uh, offered me a show, they had seen my nudes before, so I didn't think this would be an issue. But unfortunately, they scheduled it during the summer when there was um, the kids art camp over the summer at this museum. And they freaked out at the thought that little kids would see this. And I'm saying, well, you knew I was going to do a nude. And if little kids know that this is BDSM gear, they've got more problems <laughs> than, you know, seeing this like, you know, and I mean, the parents, it was the parent that would no, it was the museum anticipating the parents freaking out. And I'm thinking these kids are not going to know what they're looking at. And Instead, they decided to take my entire show, put it on the top floor behind, I'm not kidding, signage saying no one can enter this space unless they're over 18 years old. And they put a curtain up. So nobody saw the damn show. There was no indication on the first floor that I had to show upstairs. Oh. And if you happen to go upstairs, you just saw this curtain and unless you stopped to read the sign, you didn't even know that there was a show back there. So I was infuriated. Sometimes museum visitors, I guess, have a little more agency than they even know. They can control imaginary. things without even having seen it. <laughs> imaginary visitors. Yes, I'm so happy. Um, OK, uh, did you want to? Pause on this I one. I just am trying to be mindful of time. Let's keep going. Okay. Self-portrait. I'm one of the few. I'm, I, I think we probably need to um, hurry up. Um, All right. Another risk picture. This is the literary theorist Sorry. Aaron Berlant. That is, so the portrait of Alison Bechdel is now in the National Portrait Gallery. This is as well. Um, Lauren died uh, almost two years ago. Um, and uh, there's always too much to say about these. The story of all of these is in the book. So this is a thing about the book. It's, um, so it's a memoir, but at the back, there's an entire section. So the, the I, I do need to point this out. The book is completely in color. So it's a catalog resume of my work. So there's like 65 images. And at the back, there's an entire section called the portraits. And so for instance, every single person got a repeated thumbnail and then either me talking about what it was like to work with them, what the portrait's about, or I invited them to write for themselves. So it's again, a dialogue where anyone who is willing to write their own description of um, our collaboration, uh, they were they if I could get text from them that's what's in there and it's just incredible because you know you're so used to talking to artists and asking them well what does this mean well how did the process go and it's like oh well a mystery wrapped in an enigma what do you think and so it's just really amazing to get the actual insight from the artist and the subjects themselves so thank you for including all that I was honored um did you want to touch on the zoom portraits before we wrap up um, just, uh, when COVID hit, I had a breakdown kind of, I thought, how am I supposed to be a portrait artist if no one can come to my studio ever again? And it took about six months, but I started to figure out how to work over Zoom. So people now sit for me, um, over Zoom. And the first one I did is, uh, Alice Wong, um, the world famous, uh, 
disability activist and writer. Um, Alice is in San Francisco. She almost just died last month. And I'm trying to um, raise some money for her, for her care. But this was the first, pardon me, the first one. And I actually drew the screensaver on my laptop around the, um, sorry, all of a sudden hiccuping. Uh, the, the Zoom, you know, what we're looking at here. So this was done, like I said, also live, but at a remove. And it's also on Mylar, drawn on the front and painted from the back. Great. Um, this was another one you sent from that same series. Yes, um, really, really long story here. Okay. Um, it's big. Um, all right, then did you, let's see. Were the last uh, few there, Achi and Will? Yes. So this is currently at the National Portrait Gallery. It's been acquired by the um, Hirshhorn. And uh, this, we started this right before COVID hit. So we, again, had to finish it, not only over Zoom, but um, mailing things back and forth. And just very briefly, the scraps of paper that you're seeing are um, Achi writing about her sexual history. And I gave her two envelopes. One said, uh, tell me stories that you're willing to share with the public. And the other envelope said, tell me stories that no one will, you don't want anyone else to ever read. And I sewed those stories up into these scrolls that you see that are in the vitrine that go with the piece. And I think the next slide, the vitrine was actually destroyed in shipping. Mm -hmm. So I had to completely re redesign it. Um, this is actually now what it looks like. And it, this is what's in Washington. Um, but I've been doing these pieces where I've been trying to pull, a, as you saw with the drawings, a lot of them are dimensional. Um, and I've been trying to pull the dimensionality into these these vitrines that are in a dialogue um, with the drawing. And I think there's one last one. This is, if anybody does read the book, this is William from the book. I kept, he came to visit me recently and I kept introducing him as William from the book as he was my college boyfriend. And if you look at the, you cannot see it, but the vitrine, last thing I'll explain is he's an architect. We mailed piece that, that table that he's using, that sort of drafting table was mailed back and forth, it's dimensional. And it has pieces of architectural model on it and drawings of uh, uh, a mechanical pencil and an X-Acto knife. Um, but the little vitrine is um, a piece of the imaginary house that he had designed when he thought we would always stay together. And I made three little figures. Um, on one side, you can see maybe just a little bit of a couple standing in the doorway and it's the two of us. But if you turn the vitrine around, there's another one of me and I'm walking away. So I think that that's it for the work. Yeah, definitely get the book and read it for more information about all of those stories because they are just absolutely amazing. Um, I didn't get any chats in, a, in no as far as questions go. Does anyone have any before we say goodbye? I think I've stunned them all into silence. <laughs> I'm here for you guys. Well, well, I suppose not. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Reva. I really appreciate all your thoughts and insights. Um, everyone be sure to go to uh, the bookshop in Glen Ellen or Women and Children First for a copy of Golem Girl. It is beautiful and amazing. I've read it. I love it. Highly recommend. Um, so I guess that's it for the night. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you again, Reva. Stay safe, everybody. You too. Thanks for coming. Good night. Thank you. Good night.